The central message of the short letter of Jude is fighting for the true faith. It is often linked with the second letter of Peter. There, Peter had given warning about false teachers who would, at a future date, seek to corrupt the true Christian faith. In Jude, those false teachers had arrived and were at work. It is generally thought that Jude was written about AD 80 and was one of the last letters to be written in the New Testament. As such, the New Testament books are arranged in a moral order. We start with a presentation of the Lord in the Gospels before finding out about the birth of the Church, Acts, through the Gospel, Romans. By the time we get to Jude, where we find strong warning about the spiritual dangers to come in the last days, we see the moral state of the church compromised before the end times, as outlined in the Revelation. For this reason, the message of the book of Jude is very much for our day. We need just to identify the three groups of people that Jude is writing about. He identifies those who had never truly been saved, although had made a loud claim to be Christians. Over time, they would give up on the truth of the Bible, and a genuine following after the Lord Jesus. These are often referred to as apostates. They were to be rejected. However, there would be those who had been truly saved, but had been led astray by these false teachers. These were to be rescued. Lastly, there were those who remained true to his word. It was to them that Jude was writing. These were to be rewarded. Jude is likely to have been a half-brother of the Lord Jesus and the brother of James, who wrote one of the New Testament letters. Strictly speaking, his name was Judas, though understandably he did not want to be confused with Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. In the lifetime of the Lord, Jude had been one who had not believed in the ministry of Jesus. It was the power of the risen and ascended Lord that had turned Jude from a doubter to a believer. Jude does not indicate to whom he was writing. His warning is therefore general and is particularly fitting for us. In this lesson we're going to consider what Jude has to say in the first four verses. He begins by introducing himself. Instead of seeking to gain acceptance by claiming relationship to the Lord, he calls himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ. The worth of our position derives from the greatness of the one we serve. In our day, when we are so focused on celebrity, and where often, even in Christian things, we make much of who a certain speaker is, we do well to remember that it really is all about him. Jude would, however, claim relationship to James, a prominent man in the church in Jerusalem, to ensure that those who read his letter recognised its authority. Jude loves grouping his thoughts together into threes, so he starts off by recognising that his readers have been called, sanctified and preserved. These are three great things that are true of all believers. Firstly, God has called us by the Gospel. See 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14. None of us are Christians by accident or arrive in God's kingdom unannounced. God has had his eye on each one of us and has been at work to ensure that we now belong to him. He has set us apart, sanctified, to be particular objects of his love. Some translations have this second attribute as beloved by God the Father. What a wonderful thing it is to be the person about whom God has focused his love. He has removed us from the crowd so that he can particularly focus his love on us. Because he loves us so much, we are precious to him and so he keeps us safe. We are preserved by him. The same word that Peter uses in 1 Peter 1 verse 4, speaking about our inheritance in heaven. Not one of us will be lost. All believers will be kept by God until we are with him forever, sharing his eternal home. 
Jude then wishes a second set of three things for his readers. Mercy, peace and love. And these were to be multiplied to them. The idea here is one of growth, of enjoyment and appreciation, of display and reality. These three blessings will certainly help us face the adversity of standing up to those who have corrupted the faith. Verse 3 appears to suggest that Jude's original intention was to write to them concerning their shared or common faith. When Jude speaks about the faith, he is not referring to the attitude of heart and mind that brought us to salvation. He is referring to the faith, the body of truth that we believe in. It includes the whole teaching about Christianity as revealed in the Bible. And Jude highlights that this truth has been given by the apostles once and for all. The 27 books of the New Testament and the 39 books of the Old Testament are the full and complete revelation of God for us today. Everything that we need to know, God has already chosen to reveal to us there is nothing missing. We need to absolutely reject the idea that there are missing gospels, letters of truth written that are newly discovered, or revelations from God that have just been given or are yet to be delivered. God may choose to speak a helpful word for the moment through an individual today, but this in no way has the authority of his given word. What we read in the Bible is sufficient for us to live lives that are fully pleasing to him. We must not add or take away from that. This was to be what these false teachers would be doing. Our final set of three things concerns the character of those false teachers who had infiltrated the church. It is worth just reinforcing the point that if there were apostates in the church in the first century, then there surely are false teachers in the church in the 21st century. They are to be avoided at all costs. But how do we recognise them? It is not as if they introduce themselves, Oh, hello, I'm John. I am an apostate. Well, Jude gives us three key features of these kinds of people. They are ungodly. They may use religious language and dress the part, but in their hearts they have no love for God and have no desire to be like him. Second, they have turned the grace of God to immorality. Because we are no longer bound by a set of rules, they have rejected all kinds of morality. Very often they dress this up under the language of inclusion and open-mindedness. To be a Christian is to behave in the way that Jesus did. He always pleased his Father, so should we. He always put others first, so should we. He never pleased himself, nor should we. Some things are right, some things are wrong. Our behaviour should be of the highest moral calibre. Thirdly, they denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to understand that these two titles for God refer to the one person, Jesus Christ. He is sovereign, Lord God. He is to be obeyed by his subjects, Lord. He is Saviour, Jesus. He is the Messiah who will reign, Christ. In his commentary on this passage, Ken Fleming puts it like this. Apostates deny it all, that he is sovereign, the Saviour, the Lord and the Christ. When we put these four titles into a modern setting, it may startle us. To believe in evolution is to deny his sovereignty. To disobey his word is to deny his lordship. To add one single human work to salvation is to deny his saviourhood and to disbelieve in his coming rule over the whole earth is to deny his messiahship. Millions who call themselves Christians may be more apostate than they think. Some would deny that Jesus is the only saviour, but rather insist that any faith in whatever is of equal value. This is apostasy. 
Some would say that modern culture must define the way that we understand sexual morality. This is apostasy. Some would suggest that Jesus was not truly a man, nor fully God, that he could have sinned, that he did not die or that the resurrection is a myth. This is apostasy. Some might deny that Jesus is to return and reign in person over the earth. This is apostasy. Only what the Bible teaches is for the believer. We have been warned by Jude and by others who long ago were inspired by God to give similar warning to his people. See Enoch in Jude 14 and verse 15, or Isaiah, Isaiah 8, verses 19 to 22. Let us, in our generation, be on our guard.